Uh, there are two basic methods to make CO2 GANs. Uh, the traditional method, uh, shown on the left, using nanocoated copper plate and a zinc plate in a salt solution. And then there is the graphite rod method, uh, which, uses, which replaces the nanocoated copper with a graphite rod, which seems to have similar kind of properties and uh, produces Ganses that are in many ways similar to the nanocoated copper plate. I actually prefer the graphite rod method because it's faster in producing CO2 and also a lot simpler and uh, less messy to work with. So uh, the information that follows is uh, largely a gear to that particular method. Uh, the main difference between the two is that the, the copper in the traditional method, the copper plate in the traditional method, together with the zinc plate in a salt solution, provides us with a electrolytic potential difference, which is around about 0.7 volts, I think. And that drives a current uh, between the plates if, if they are connected, uh, usually with an LED or a resistance would do the job as well. Whereas with the graphite rod method, we don't have that potential difference because the, the graphite rod doesn't have the same uh, voltage difference. However, the graphite rod does generate a small potential difference with the zinc plate. So if, if you connect the, the rod to the zinc plate, you will get a very small current and therefore you will get CO2 being produced but it will be a slow process. You need some kind of power supply to get the best out of this method and you can control uh, various parameters to get different effects as I will discuss in what follows. Um, the other major difference between the two is that with the graphite rod method, there is there are kind of it's a strange phenomenon where you get uh, two phases happening. Uh, one is the initial phase where uh, you get mostly CO2 forming, depending to some extent on on the current level. Uh, generally, with both methods, the higher the current, the more zinc you're producing. Uh, but with the graphite rod, there is another factor that comes in and that is that uh, after a certain period, for reasons uh, really a bit mysterious to me, the, all of a sudden the process switches over from producing mostly CO2 to producing mostly uh, zinc oxide gains and you, get, you actually get a pretty distinct layer, white layer forming on top of the CO2 layer for the first phase, as you will see in the videos that follow. So that impacts uh, what proportions of CO2 versus zinc oxide you have in the mixture. That property can in fact be used to uh, get a, a desired combination of CO2 and zinc oxide gains in your mixture by stopping the experiment at a, at a certain time. Uh, in the case of, uh, say, uh, 50 milliamp current, the, the zinc oxide phase kicks in after about six or seven hours, I found. Cleaning the carbon rod uh, delays that uh, onset, but eventually, even with cleaning the rod, the, the second phase starts happening. Not sure exactly why. It's an interesting phenomenon. Uh, with that introduction, let's have a look at some examples. Okay, here's an example of system in operation. We have a 10 milliamps current. I'm using a um, 100 ohm resistor in the circuit. And there's 1.5 volts from the power supply. Now this is not going to be the same for every situation, it will depend on things like uh, the salt concentration uh, and other things, uh, but it gives you a typical 
example of what you can expect. We now have a look at the Gans production unit. We have the typical arrangement with graphite rod, uh, zinc plate, not too far apart. We have the air bubbler. And if we have a look at the bottom, uh, we see uh, this translucent looking material that uh, might be hard to uh, make out, which I think is actually a good sign. It means that it's probably close to pure CO2. Well, I believe in I. And I've cleaned this rod every six hours or so. Okay, so here's another example. We've got 50 milliamps current, uh, 1.7 volts in the power supply, and I'm currently using a 20 ohm resistor in the circuit. If we have a look at the GANs being produced, uh, if I zoom in, you, you might be able to see a translucent, fairly thick translucent layer at the bottom. Uh, not so easy to see, which actually again is a good sign because I think it's close to pure CO2. It's actually similar to the 10 milliamp case. So, with uh, cleaning of the rod, I think the 50 milliamp case gives quite good quality CO2. Um, I clean the rod about every couple of hours in this case and and this has been going for about uh, six, seven hours. There is one significant difference in the 50 milliamp case and that is that uh, we actually getting some GANs forming on the surface. Uh, most of it has gone to the back of the uh, container because of the action of the bubbler which pushes the whole thing at the back but the, the you can clearly see kind of an oily appearance so I'm taking that to mean that we have some amino acids at the top which similar similarly to the nanocoded plate scenario uh, which kind of makes sense to me because if the oily type material mixes in with some of the GANs and pushes it to the surface. So that would explain the top bit and we, and we have the normal one at the bottom. Okay, here's uh, another example, this time at 200 milliamps approximately. And 2.2 volts and I'm also using a 5 ohm resistor which gives me that 200 milliamp and here if we look at the GANS production unit we start to see something very interesting uh, if we zoom in you should be able to see that there is a white zinc oxide layer starting to form on top of the typical CO2 translucent layer at the bottom. There is a clear separation between the two layers and uh, the, we know that the white layer must contain a significant amount of zinc oxide GANs because uh, when the second white phase commences uh, the zinc plate starts to be consumed noticeably whereas prior to that phase transition there's not much sign of that happening if we uh, zoom in here i'm not sure how clear this will come up but even on the top there is a uh, sort of darker co2 type layer on the top and a white uh, zinc layer at the bottom which is where the new material is forming okay here's another uh, 50 milliamp uh, experiment uh, this time 
the difference here is that the uh, salt concentration is 1% rather than the typical 3% that I've been using. Uh, someone mentioned that 1% may help with the CO2 production, so I'm trying it out to see what happens. Um, so, so far we, we're seeing similar results to the 3%. We have the typical translucent CO2 material at the bottom. However, one thing that is different is the amino acid layer at the top, which is a fair bit smaller than for the 3% case. And then we have, if I zoom in on, there you can see that there's not much of a layer there at all. And in fact, I've tried it with a um, smaller concentration than 1% and there's even less. So it seems that the salt concentration has a significant effect on how much amino acids we get forming, which is interesting. And the other thing which also affects the amino acid formation is the current. Uh, the higher the current, the more uh, amino acids are formed. I'm not sure what the exact mechanism is there. Other than that, there is not a lot of difference with the 3 cent versus 1. It's still, you still get the white layer, white zinc layer forming after a certain period. Uh, pretty much the same as for the two cases, 1 and 3 percent. The result of all this is that we can use the carbon rod method to create uh, close to pure CO2 as well as close to pure zinc oxide gains and uh, anything in between pretty much. Uh, here is an example of a range of uh, proportions of the two, starting with the first one here which is close to pure CO2 uh, produced with 10 milliamp current and as you can see it's fairly condensed compared to the next ones that we're going to show and it's fairly also dark as well which is typical actually of the nanocoated copper applied method as well where the the pure CO2 tends to be a considerably more uh, condensed than, uh, than the, the mixtures which are a lot more fluffy. An example which is shown in the second uh, bottle. So we have here about 80 to 90 percent CO2 and as you can see it's a lot fluffier and less condensed and if I move it around it it moves around in a kind of a wave-like watery motion um, that suggests that there are forces that are keeping uh, the, the whole mixture together uh, and in fact you can get some unusual things happening um, like this for example when if you tip the whole thing over slowly so that it doesn't uh, start. You, you can see that it mostly stays up at uh, the top without um, falling down, uh, gravity defying stuff. So then the other, the other thing that this suggests is that there is also a second force that actually keeps the two GANs separate. Um, to make it more fluffy so it's a kind of like a balance the, the combination of CO2 GANs and zinc oxide GANs reaches a balance point between the separation and the attraction and, and makes it stay there uh, okay the next one is the uh, about 75 percent CO2 and we can see that it's starting to go a little bit whiter and it's less fluffier but still moves around a bit like the previous one 
the next one is about 60% CO2 and again you can see that it's starting to look a little bit lighter next one is about 60% zinc oxide and uh, the white is starting to come out the last one is mostly zinc oxide and again this is the whitest of them all and um, the camera may not show the the, the exact uh, color differences but that we see with the eye but there's a distinct difference in the whiteness from here to here for example uh, so um, I think this can be used the color can be used to get at least an approximate indication of the proportion of CO2 versus zinc oxide gains and uh, we can control the ratio to some extent as explained earlier by allowing the white layer to form a zinc oxide gains layer and then stopping it when the desired proportion has been reached uh, so there we have it